public agenda items. It's now 131. Can I get a roll call, please? Good afternoon. Let the record re reflect all supervisors are present um, with Supervisor Parker, Alejo, and Phillips and Adams appearing via video conference and Chair Supervisor Lopez appearing in person. Thank you. So our first item is to conduct a public hearing and adopt a resolution uh, to authorize the county uh, administrative officers that, or his designee to apply for and accept grant funds to hear more about what those funds might help us do in Monterey County. Anastasia Wyatt. Good afternoon, supervisors. So today, we I have a couple of grant applications for housing. So I'm, I, the first thing I'm going to do is just upfront let you know. I'm going to use a few acronyms and I'm going to just let you know what they are right up front and probably I'll continue to use them throughout the presentation. The first is the permanent local housing allocation, PLHA, and the other is the local housing trust fund, LHTF. I think we're pulling up the presentation, right, Julian? Thank you. So the, there is a kind of a long list of items that we need to address during this presentation. The first is under the permanent local housing allocation to authorize the county administrative officer to accept the grant funds and uh, authorize the auditor controller to create a fund for those grant funds as well. Then the next series is the local housing trust fund. And these, uh, these grants are intertwined. I'm going to explain that a little bit throughout the presentation. So the local housing trust fund is a little tricky. So it involves multiple cities. It, we are going to create a regional housing trust fund. And we will be utilizing some of Monterey Bay Economic Partnership or MBEP funding um, in order to create the fund. So I'll get into that a little bit later but these are all of the items that we're gonna address related to that. Okay. So the first is the Permanent Local Housing Allocation, or PLHA. This funding uh, is pretty flexible. It's really interesting funding that the state is providing us. And I think the state is trying to help us re refill our coffers for housing money. So after you know redevelopment was lost, I think the state is in different different types of grant programs to help us out. So this grant pro program is going to be for the next five, or it should be a permanent source of funding. And I'll show you the amount; it's about 648,000. We can increase the supply of housing, and they have a big focus. The state has a big focus on households that are 60 or below area median income. So big focus on helping the lower income groups where we are really seeing the biggest need, where we're not meeting our RENA regional housing needs allocation numbers. So those are some of our, um, where we, we have our biggest needs. Increase assistance to affordable owner-occupied workforce housing, assist persons experience, experiencing homelessness, facilitate <coughs> housing affordability, and of course ensure geographic equity in the distribution of the funds. So allowable activities under PLHA, there are many allowable activities. We have um, focused on four for the county. So our four that we have in our housing plan are to develop affordable multifamily housing and establish a regional housing trust fund. We are looking at this regional housing trust fund with the county of Monterey, cities of Salinas, Gonzales, Monterey, and Pacific Grove and King City, and capitalized reserves for services connected to the preservation and creation of new permanent supportive housing and to provide homeless services. So recently we applied for the No Place Like Home program through the state, and one of the biggest needs that came up was this capitalized reserve operating cost for permanent supportive housing. So when working with behavioral health, this is one of the biggest needs that we have in order to make that very low income, zero to 30% housing work out. <clears throat> Countywide PLHA allocations are listed here. 
So uh, the county is expected in the first year to get 648,380. The fiscal year 1920 is the state's fiscal year. That's what we're applying for. Our five-year allocation for the county is 3,890,000. And each of the cities within our county, are these are the other funds that they're receiving. So the really great thing about applying for a regional housing trust fund under the local housing trust fund program is that we can use these PLHA allocations to refill or to fund our regional housing trust fund. So you can only use PLHA if you to fund your housing trust fund, not dip into your general fund if you have a regional housing trust fund. But if you don't, you cannot use PLHA for a regional trust fund. So the five-year plan for PLHA for the county is the first year we're going to put quite a bit into trust funds. Um, there is some for homeless funding navigation centers and capitalized reserves. We also have for the next fiscal years, we also um, will continue with the capitalized reserves and homeless funding for navigation centers as well. We do have to spend a certain amount of this money each year. So it, it may make sense, you may think, oh, let's put it all into the trust fund, but we have to spend a certain amount. So there's other activities and there are other needs throughout the county. Can't get this to move forward, sorry. So in, in order to formulate the PLHA grant funding, uh, we, I worked with um, the RMA Resource Management Office to determine what our planning needs and housing needs. I uh, worked with uh, the Department of Social Services. We referred to the housing element, farm worker housing study, and our action plan and housing element. Uh, I also discussed with developers what some of their planning uh, requirements and what a, some of their main uh, needs are right now and for projects that are pretty ready to go. One thing is this is each year we're going to reevaluate both the PLHA and the LHTF applications and so what we're envisioning right now will be changed annually. We have to reapply for the funds every year. So this is just our outlook right now. Yeah. So uh, the next I'm going to go on to, um, we did do a public notice of both of these programs as required by the state for 10 days. And so that public notice has been out and we've definitely received comments and I appreciate everyone who has commented. Uh, now we're going to get into the, the local housing trust fund. So the purpose of this local housing trust fund through the state is to provide different types of assistance different terms, eligible activities. And again, this is more focused on building that zero to 60% area median income or AMI housing. So the state is really pushing on that. There's even a requirement that 30% of the allocation ex assists extremely low income households. So in order to make that happen, that's where the PLHA allocation to uh, assist with permanent supportive services is really needed to help make it all viable. So those are the, um, the main types of programs under the Local Housing Trust Fund. So in order to make this happen the first year, we need to come up with $750,000 just to be able to apply. And the state will match up to $5 million of this trust fund. So the more we can put into it, the better. So I appreciate that the, the board was able to um, provide some funding during our budget season to make this happen. And we're going to continue to work with other philanthropic or other uh, funders to try to augment the program and then hopefully get more cities involved and get more of that PLHA funding. So we're going to make it for the first year, thankfully, with the 750000 So we do have some funding from so the county of Monterey. We had our 370000 that we're getting from Monterey Bay Economic Partnership, and I'm going to let Matt Ware to talk about that in just a minute. And then we, the, count, the board was able to give us another 
200,000 so under the budget season. So um, the city of Salinas is also throwing in 200,000. City of Gonzales and city of Pacific Grove also committed funding. So our first year allocation, we're gonna have 1.26 million. So we're really happy about that. <laughs> and it will be matched by the state if we are successful in our competitive application. So in order, this is just my projections right now. We will work with other cities to get more funding committed under PLHA for the outlook for the next fiscal year. So I'm gonna let Matt Huerta discuss the MBEP Housing Trust Fund. Good afternoon, uh, Chair, Supervisors, um, and thank you, staff. Uh, thank you, Anastasia, for for um, your partnership and for all of the the work thus far to to get to where we're at. Uh, we want to thank the county for really um, uh, <clears throat> the initial investment that kicked off the. Um, the local housing trust fund here, uh, the Monterey Bay Housing Trust Fund, uh, over two years ago, and um, we have a lot of success to report. Um, over, uh, there's been five loans. Over seven million dollars have been invested in the region. Um, despite our our best efforts at supporting local developers, and um, they've really been constrained in terms of moving various projects forward that could take advantage of this funding source primarily because of um, lack of, of local subsidy and, and even state subsidy that just recently became replenished. You all re remember and played a critical role as well in joining us and supporting um, propositions uh, one and two, one which funded uh, $4 billion, uh, the Homes and Jobs Act uh, a couple of years ago. And during that same time, um, the SB2 funding that is actually now this uh, permanent uh, local um, housing allocation that uh, Anastasia just described um, is basically the fruits of all that advocacy work at the local and state level. And so now we're able to start moving those dollars forward. But meanwhile, we really were not able to move more than just, we did have one project that was funded in Monterey County in Castroville for Chispa to move the Castroville Oaks project forward. So that has been moving forward considerably even during this time. And that would at some, hopefully at some point produce over 210 units of affordable housing in, in North County. Um, but meanwhile, while we've been trying to support projects, we've learned a lot and we've built capacity. And in fact, we should all be um, happy that we have uh, strengthened our partnership with Silicon Valley um, with, with the Housing Trust of Silicon Valley, which now sees our, uh, has relationships down here and has uh, been able to move several um, housing developments forward, again, primarily in Santa Cruz County at this point, but um, certainly is available and has capacity to move projects forward um, in the future for uh, um, Monterey County developments as well. Um, all that said, what we learned was that, again, the, the biggest need was to uh, provide more support for permanent, long-term, 55-year financing that would really allow uh, nonprofit developers like Chispa, Eden Housing, MidPen, EAH Housing, and others to um, develop prop projects here in the region for farm workers, seniors, and others that really uh, are our most vulnerable populations. Um, the financing needed there, again, is the 55-year, 0% uh, percent, um, zero to 3%, but deferred payments. That fund, those funding sources typically do come from state or federal sources, uh, especially after the elimination of local redevelopment agencies. And the county was a leader in, in uh, using those funds uh, early in the 2000s, um, and then it was eliminated around 2013, as you, many of you re will remember. So I think we're just at a pivotal moment here where we can leverage the uh, dollars that the scarce dollars that we do have and try to leverage the state dollars that are now available um, through this $300 million new line item, again, that was replenished and funded by uh, Prop 1. And so uh, we support 
the county and its efforts and have reconfigured our funding source uh, so that uh, we could reallocate funding um, to this effort. And also uh, by, while maintaining this, this short-term bridge financing resource that we've been able to establish now, uh, we wanna make sure that that stays available at a, at a lower uh, funded amount, but still available for other projects. We know that there's at least one project, one strong project in the pipeline that we wanna be available for. And that's uh, Chispa's project at Mills Ranch in King City that they expect to close on within the next 12 months. And so we do, ha we have retained some of the county's uh, contribution uh, into the Monterey Bay Housing Trust Fund to support that project as an example. And that project, the funds that we have now would be leveraged four to one um, as originally anticipated. So um, that's it. And I'm here available for, for any uh, questions that, that uh, supervisors may have. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. So that wraps up the presentation and uh, we are just requesting to be able to go forward with the application. Okay, so I'm going to turn this point at this point and see if we have any comments from board members. I see Supervisor Phillips. Yeah, um, Anastasia, uh, uh, I didn't pull that uh, number 28. I know my office is asking some questions. We just wanted to make sure that uh, we kept the flag flying for um, Castorville Oaks, but uh, uh, I do want to say, uh, boy, the work on housing uh, that in the energy and momentum that you're bringing to us, finding um, affordable housing for our workforce is, is, uh, has been great since you came on board and really got us re-energized and, and going this way. Uh, and, and as we see, even with COVID, where is it impacted most? It's, it's the areas where people are living in a crowded environment that they shouldn't be living in. And uh, that's what we want. I, I guess my only question is, I, I know we've been dealing with uh, and have to deal with the Coastal Commission on Castorville Oaks. Uh, um, do you see that? And, and so much of my jurisdiction, even though it's not right on the coast, my, my jurisdiction uh, in North County um, it, it involves the Coastal Commission. Do you see that being a, a major hurdle for us up here uh, with our water problems and other things? Well, I have Dana Cleary here from Chispa, so is it all right if I let her comment Please. on that? Please, Dana. Right. I'm Dana Cleary with Chispa. Yeah, is this better? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I just want to thank Anastasia for working so hard to put this, this plan together. We, I think that we will be able to take advantage of it. We're working hard on uh, developing our plans for our housing in King City with the city manager, and, and uh, we'll have an approval probably within the next two or three weeks, so we should go forward with that and be in line for this. Um, that long-term financing is important. Uh, Castorville Oaks, you know this has been on our horizon for a long time. I can't speak for the Coastal Commission, but we intend to speak with them soon and see where we are with that. Uh, certainly what's important to us is that Castorville Oaks be identified in your housing plan. Thank you. All right, thank you, Supervisor Phillips. I'm gonna go to Supervisor Adam next. Supervisor Adams. Thanks very much. Anastasia, I, I would echo what uh, Supervisor Phillips said. You've just really been doing a terrific job and we're all so appreciative of it. I really thank you for that. Can you give me an idea of what the time frame is, what the timeline is? I know we have this a certain amount, a, a date by which we have to get the applications or the, yeah, I guess you would call it the application in, but what's, what can we expect when and what should we be looking for? The LHA application is due the 27th, the July 27th, so Monday, and then the local housing trust fund application is due August 3rd. So we'll submit those applications and then um, I, th I think you have a question. <laughs> I was just going to ask and then when, uh, when do they make their decision? I, PLHA should be very straightforward. We should get that funding annually from here on out, um, so that's that's a good thing. 
I expect maybe a couple of months, three months turnaround on the PLHA and local housing trust fund. The state's been a little slow. They've got a lot going on, a lot of funding programs. I, I would say anywhere from three to six months. Okay, great. Hopefully Thank you very much. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Okay, at this point, seeing no other supervisor hands up, I'm going to turn to the public and take public comment on this item. I see Jane Barr on the Zoom. Jane Barr, we're going to give you the ability to unmute yourself and share a two-minute public comment with this board. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm assuming you can hear me. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, thank you very much, Jane Barr with Eden Housing. I just want to... Uh, wholeheartedly support uh, Anastasia's work in regard to the PLA and the Housing Trust. Um, it's really a no-brainer. We get uh, dollars matched to the dollars from the Housing Trust Fund that we we uh, put together. So it's a no-brainer and um, good work, and I hope that it's supported by the board. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. We appreciate your public comment. Anybody else in the room? All right. Seeing nobody coming forward, I'll bring it back to this board. And I did just want to share a few brief comments. Um, I know we took this up during the budget hearings, but it's as we've moved through COVID, as we've continued down this path, I think it shows more and more the need for additional housing in our communities. The crisis that we face, it's impacting farm workers. In my mind, from the information and data that we do have access to, it shows that it's those overcrowded housing situations that are fueling the spread in this community. And so investing in housing is what we need to do. It is the crisis of our lifetime. It leads to mental health issues. It leads to physical health issues, ailments now, as we see with COVID. We have the data that shows that, and this investment is critical. And so I'm excited that I get to be chair while this is happening, that we've been able to bring this forward in such a way that we're going to get additional investment. And I, I thank everybody for their support during the budget hearings to get us to this point now where we actually get to submit these applications and the partnerships that came forward so quickly due to Anastasia and the entire team's work to bring all those partnerships together in a very quick timeline and be before us today with a 1.2 initial investment. That is incredible. So thank you for all that you're doing on behalf of the families of the 3rd District and all of Monterey County. Uh, with that, I'm going to go to Supervisor Alejo. Yeah, I just I didn't want this topic to end without um, re-messaging re, um, to our community how important housing is for a lot of different reasons, not only for our workforce, but to address our homelessness crisis, um, but, but also just overall health of the community. It, it, it's really fundamentally begins with creating more housing here. So, um, and, uh, and some of these programs take some time to get off the ground, but, uh, but I hope that um, it continues to be a priority for the legislature to continue to uh, provide resources to local governments to get these projects off the ground and also to look for other ways that we could help expedite permitting and, and working with local developers who do want to get projects off the ground to be able to uh, facilitate that more expeditiously. It's very expensive in housing. There's been some um, projects and proposals in the pipeline in Salinas and Alan Gonzalez and Soledad and Greenfield, um, but they seem to move slowly. I'm on year four as a county supervisor and I, like, I would have loved to see a lot more housing construction break ground and be completed by now but I know there's a lot of market conditions, but this is just a reminder for all of us as a board that as we see projects come that make sense, um, that we should be able to support those to address the most pressing need um, for our communities all over the county, not just in the Salinas Valley, but on the peninsula, North County, South County as well, and, and here in Salinas for sure. So I just wanted to express that. And um, I know we get this message by Matt often, I agree. Um, and I certainly wanna have those projects come before us and approve those, but it also starts with having some of these funding mechanisms that can make projects pencil out and get off the ground. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Alejo. We're gonna to go to Supervisor Parker next. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, along the same lines as others have been saying, I just think it's important. I'm really glad to see the state coming forward with, uh, you know, with money um, that we can then, um, uh, also match with some of our local money to start moving some of these uh, housing units forward. We know, uh, we've known for a while now that the old model 
of a small percentage of affordable units uh, within larger projects that go at market rate um, has actually probably been putting us further behind um, all the time. And um, we know from our nonprofit housing builders that they're ready to uh, build housing that um, can be affordable to our workforce, but um, they need funds to help them um, get it going um, and then also to help with the financing. So it's, it's really critical. This has been a need for decades in our county and um, there, there has been sort of fluctuating will and fluctuating money, um, mostly a, a lack of money to make it happen. So I'm really pleased that we're getting to a point where we can actually um, uh, add some money to the pot so that our uh, nonprofit builders can do what they know how to do and really start providing um, some, some housing that the people who live and work in our communities can afford um, to live in. Thanks. Thank you, Supervisor. And I will share with the board last week, I was on the call with Matt Huerta for the Monterey Bay Economic Partnerships Housing Forum. And I got to feel like a little bit of a rock star because I got to, when they asked, what are you doing to help support local housing? I got to say, well, tune in this Tuesday. We'll have a $1 million regional housing trust fund starting up and everybody was excited about it. Uh, so with that, I believe that now we're to the point of action, and I will open it up to see if I have a motion on these uh, items. Let's see. It's so moved. B. Second. I've got a motion from Alejo and a second through, through uh, Supervisor Phillips on items B through G. Roll call vote, please. Supervisor Alejo? Aye. Supervisor Phillips? Aye. Supervisor Parker? Aye. Supervisor Adam? Aye. And Chair Supervisor Lopez? Aye. The motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. At this point, we're going to head into item 13, which is a public hearing to consider adding 285 to Forest Lodge Road, house to the Monterey County Register of Historic Resources, the local official Register of Historic Resources. And that presentation will be from Brandon Swanson and Craig Spencer. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Craig Spencer with Monterey County Resource Management Agency. Um, put up some photos of the property. If you would just give me a moment. Okay. Uh, yeah, good afternoon, Chair Lopez and Supervisors. Craig Spencer again with Resource Management Agency, uh, bringing before you a request to add the Held TA residents to the Monterey County Register of Historic Resources. The Pell TA residence is located at 2852 Forest Lodge Road in Pebble Beach. The home on the site was constructed at beginning in 1926 at, after its design by notable architect Clarence Tantau. The home was enlarged later and but maintains its Spanish colonial style, which is uh, considered by our, uh, the historian who prepared the report for this project to be an excellent example of early architecture in the Del Monte Forest. Uh, due to the property's association with Clarence Tantau and its association with early development of Pebble Beach, it was found to be eligible for listing on the county's register of historic places. The item was also brought to the Historic Resource Review Board for a recommendation to your board. The Historic Review Board recommended approval unanimously of the listing of this home. It is the intent of the property owner to apply for a Mills Act contract. That Mills Act contract would be processed separately from the proposal to add this item to the register at this time. Um, with that, staff is recommending that the board approve and add the Peltier residents to the Monterey County Register of Historic Resources be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Spencer. First, I'll go to the board and see if we have any questions from board members. Seeing no hands going up, I'll turn to the public and see if there's any public comment on this recommendation from staff. Mr. Light. Yeah, Bill Light, Monterey County resident. Um, you know, there's a lot of discussion and dialogue about our history, history of this country, history of this state. Uh, there might be a large percentage of people, or at least a good chunk of people in this county, that may view this, adding this to the historical register as a 
sort of support for colonialism and Spanish uh, uh, suppression of, indig of indigenous people. So I think that should, you know, you're all going to vote on this, so I just assume you're going to approve it. But um, just know that, the, you know, people are <laughs> being really reflective these days on these kinds of things. And so, uh, you know, citing it as a, as a typical example of Klanis, uh, Spanish, early Spanish architecture here in Monterey County may not, may, may not ring well in some people's ears. So just bring that to your attention. Thank you, Mr. Life. We're going to go to Jason and Jean-Marie Beltier next. You should have. Thank you. Uh, there you go. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to address the board. Uh, we uh, so appreciate the assistance we've gotten from the county staff. Uh, they've been responsive. They've been quick. They've been helpful. Uh, and uh, this is kind of a whole new area to be moving into for us. So their help has been essential. So thank you to all. That's all. Thank, thank you. All right. I'm going to bring it back to the board. We're seeing no additional hands up via the Zoom for consideration action questions. I'd like to uh, move that we uh, support the staff's recommendation and also add that I had the opportunity to drive by and take a, a good look at the property with which I was familiar uh, anyway, because it's an outstanding um, home. So um, I'm really delighted that we're going to be able to ensure that it's saved. Thank you. Got a motion from Supervisor Adams. Second. Second from Supervisor Parker. Roll call vote. Supervisor Leho. Aye. Supervisor Phillips. Aye. Supervisor Parker. Aye. Supervisor Adams. Aye. And Chair Supervisor Lopez. Aye. The motion carries. Thank you very much. We're going to head into item 14, which is to receive the 2020 economic contributions of Monterey County Agriculture Report from our Ag Commissioner, Mr. Henry Gonzalez. Good afternoon, Chair Lopez, members of the board, Mr. McKee, Mr. Gerard. Uh, it's uh, my uh, pleasure to be here today and present to you this incredible report. Ag commissioners are mandated to, to create a report of the production value of their crops in their respective county, of crops in their respective counties. And, and so we do this every year. You may have heard me at a time or two mention that of the billions of dollars generated by agriculture in the county of Monterey, that from that amount, the growers must pay their workers must pay for their leases, their taxes, their electricity, their loans, their seed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I always add that so that no one gets the idea that farmers have this four plus billion dollars in their pockets. Uh, that's not the way it works. This report, and this is now the third, which I'm gonna have to call a series of reports, this report captures what we sometimes talk about as, as the multiplier effect. Uh, it, it's also my pleasure today to be accompanied by the, 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 the creators of this report who are really the, the brains behind the science that helped quantify what that multiplier uh, effect is to the economy here in the county. That would be uh, Dr. Langholz and Dr. DePaulitz, uh, and they are both uh, professors at the uh, Middlebury Institute uh, of International Studies. So they are here today, uh, which I'm very thankful because they can answer any technical questions about how these numbers were derived. And I think you'll find the information uh, most interesting as, as I have. So 
Uh, without further ado, I'd like to uh, ask them to come up. Thank you, Commissioner Gonzalez, for that introduction. And I'll just, uh, as the commissioner said, we are, Dr. DePaulis and I are professors at the Middlebury Institute. As professors, we get paid to stand up and talk at great length, usually one hour classes or two hour classes, but today we commit to eight minutes flat. And uh, also, people Go ahead call. And start the timer. <laughs> start the timer. People call economics the dismal science, with good reason, but we will try to make it less dismal than usual. Um, in our eight minutes, we'll cover five things. Fernando will do the first three. He'll give some background, talk about the main results with respect to economic output and employment, and then I'll do the last two items, number four and five, which has to do with diversification within agriculture and then um, ecosystem services. With that, here's Fernando. Could you do the flipping? Okay, sure. Hello. Thank you for having us here today. Um, as you know, uh, the law mandates the counties to provide information about the value, what we call the gate value of crops. But that is it's just that. It, it includes very little of the entire process of producing those crops and also where those crops can end up as input of something else in the economic system. So the, uh, this economic uh, analysis that we are uh, introducing today expands the value of the gate price to include the value of processing the output of agriculture into food production, only the locally sourced food production, the employment associated with both the agriculture and the food production sectors, and the multiplier effect. The first one that we did was back in uh, 2012, and then we did an update in 2015. And since then, we've done almost 20 other counties. And we can say with a little bit of uh, uh, enlightened uh, decision-making early, almost 10 years ago, that uh, Monterey County was the leader in, in providing this type of expanded analysis. Um, so probably a little bit of envy on part of all the other ag commissioners that also wanted to have a report like that. Um, the main components of the multiplier effect are two pieces. The indirect effect, which is the uh, economic activity related to the suppliers of the agriculture industry, and the induced effect, which are the uh, income and consumption related um, parts of the economy that are generated by households as consumers. When the, in, the industry and its suppliers create output, it provides income to households and households consume locally. We are accounting for both effects. The first one is also called inter-industry effect, and the second one is also called consumer or household spending effect. The total aggregate value of the production of agriculture and food processing in Monterey County for the year 2018, which is the last one for which there's reliable available data, is $11.7 billion. That's a pretty significant expansion from um, the 7.4, almost $7.4 billion in uh, direct economic output and a value of multiplier effect of over $4 billion. The $7.4 billion represents almost 20% of the total output in the county. This is, this is a significant portion of the economic activity in Monterey County. So that's why it's so important to properly quantify and identify the sources of production and consumption of input as well as employment and household consumption. And the little bit that we're going to be hearing uh, in, in this chamber today, about an hour, um, around $1.3 million will be produced uh, in the industry and its related um, ancillary services. So this is, this is something that is very important for uh, policymakers, but also for the public in general to understand how important the agriculture industry and its related 
sectors are in Monterey County. The total number of jobs related to this uh, set of activities is about almost 64,000 jobs. That's almost one in five jobs in the county. This is significantly higher and more intense than in other counties because Monterey County also houses many of the services related to agriculture. In many other counties, what the almost 20 that we have analyzed, those services are usually located in some other jurisdiction, therefore are not included in our reports. Monterey County, for whatever reason, you know, historical development, geographic uh, accidents, and also the strength of the industry itself, it had a much more uh, impactful aggregation of ancillary services in the same jurisdiction. That's why the employment is so high, and that's why the impact is so high in terms of having one out of five workers or actually jobs. These are not exactly number of people. These are sort of full-time equivalent jobs. Um, be represented at 20% uh, of the labor force. Thank you, Fernando. We've covered three out of the five topics so far. We've got uh, the context, the economic value, and the employment. And the two that remain are economic diversification and then ecosystem services. Regarding the diversification, you've all heard the saying, it's, you don't want to have all your eggs in one basket because if it drops, they'll all break. And growers and ranchers face a lot of challenges, a lot of things they worry about, keeps them up at night, price drops, disease outbreaks, new regulations, competitors, price spikes, and so on. There's even uh, the coronavirus that came in this year. It's a long list. And the idea is that the more diversified uh, an industry is, the more resilient it will be to these catastrophic shocks. And there's a way of calculating the score for how diversified an, ind an industry is or a county or a university or anything else. It's a well-established formula that you use. It's the Shannon Weaver formula. And we use that to calculate how diversified um, agriculture is. And the total score, or the index, is 0 0.61. That's on a 1.0 scale. In order to get a perfect 1.0, the ag here would have to grow all 72 of California's major crops and have the production value equally distrib distributed across all 72, including rice and other things that are just not going to grow here. So it's impossible to get a perfect score. 0.61 is extremely high compared to what we've seen around the state. It suggests a high level of resilience within the agricultural industry. We tracked this over the last decade, and this slide shows the numbers going back to 2009. What I'd like you to notice here is that the score is pretty high throughout. In fact, it's been getting slightly higher. I put a strawberry in there in 2011 and 12. That was the strawberry boom when strawberries really became popular and their value grew, which reduced the total equity of the distribution. But as you can see, the number is good. What we're seeing in most other counties, almost all other counties, is the opposite. Diverse, the diversification level is declining over time as one or two crops gain prominence. For example, almonds in the Central Valley. So the bottom line here is that diversification is not only high in this county, but it's also consistent. This brings us near the finish line here. The last topic is ecosystem services. For more than a century, Monterey County has calculated the value of crops and other things you can see and sell. But there are also these invisible non-market benefits that agricultural lands produce for society. These are things that benefit people without having a dollar value assigned. For example, open space and scenic beauty. When you drive around, instead of seeing sprawl, you have beautiful areas. Uh, reduce wildfire risk. Um, that helps provide a buffer between catastrophic wildfires and urban areas, and a dozen others that are described in the report. How much, are, how much, of this, how much is all of this worth? Fortunately, the science is advanced now where we can come up with a dollar value estimate per year, and our report goes into great detail about how we come up with this. The initial estimated value for Monterey County's agricultural lands is somewhere between $4.7 and $10.9 billion per year, from these ecosystem services, these invisible benefits to people. And when you put that number in context, you may notice in the annual crop report that the total value of the commodities is $4.8 billion, yet here we see that these invisible benefits are at least that much and maybe double as well. One more thing I want to highlight from the ecosystem services is the important value of grazing lands. The rangelands and pastures that you see in the hillsides 
where the ranchers are along the Gabalon Range and the Santa Lucia Range and elsewhere, when you look up in those hills, those things are worth an estimated $4.3 to $9.2,000 per year per acre. So most of the ecosystem service values, most of the invisible contributions that ag lands make come from these grazing areas. And when you look at the annual crop report, you'll see that livestock and other things that depend on those lands might account for just 3% of the annual value of all the commodities in the county, but they are incredibly valuable for these invisible non-market benefits. With that, we'll just wrap it up here. Just the key points once again, we have a large economic output, over $11.6 billion, significant employment, one out of every five jobs, very well diversified, which provides a stabilizing force to the industry and the county economy as a whole, and very valuable ecosystem services, at least as much as the production value each year, if not double. With that, thank you very much. We'll be glad to answer any questions or take any comments. And time. How do we do? No. Great job. Great job. <laughs> Kept it nice and brief. We appreciate it. Um, I, I do want to ask a question about whether or not we included cannabis. I know this, this year was the first time that we included it as part of our crop report as an insert. I'm just curious if these numbers had that encapsulated as well or not. Yeah, the question was if we included cannabis in this analysis, and the answer is no. These are based on 2018 data, but we expect that going forward in the future, it will be feasible to incorporate cannabis. Great. Thank you. I'm going to turn to board members for questions. I see Supervisor Phillips has his hand up. Yeah, I was just, um, can, can you hear me all right? Um, yeah, I, we got you. I, I was just, I mean, obviously during, during COVID, uh, agriculture is one of the things that's kept our county <laughs> um, going. Uh, but what do you anticipate the impact of COVID is going to be uh, come uh, our report next year or year after the, on, on agriculture? A great question. It's too early to say. Uh, we were chatting with um, Commissioner Gonzalez in the hallway before this, and it's, um, it is unclear at this point just what effect the COVID-19 pandemic will have on agriculture. There's been some informal surveying take pl taking place, but the only thing we can say for sure is we'll have some firm numbers on that within the coming year and beyond. Supervisor Parker. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you both for your analysis. I really appreciated the one that um, you all did a few years ago. And um, it's very interesting to see this concept of the ecosystem services, and I'm really looking forward to when we can do a broader analysis for the whole county, not just the um, agricultural communities ecosystem uh, services. Uh, my question is, uh, where uh, and how do we find a copy of this report. Thanks for the question, Supervisor Parker, and for your support for ecosystem services and environmental uh, efforts in general. Um, the, the report should be available on the Agricultural Commissioner's website very soon, and I believe all of the supervisors have received a report separately. I see a couple copies waving in the air right now. Okay, we're going to go to Supervisor Alejo next. Supervisor Alejo. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, respond to, first of all, to Supervisor Phillips's question, because we did get uh, a preview, or we got a report actually on the crop report for our 2019 numbers, which showed that even despite the pandemic, uh, we had an increase in the overall value of crops this coming year, and that also excluded um, the cannabis um, value, which which now that we're, we're tracking that, it seems that that's another significant addition and I think already ranking number four or five overall among other uh, crops in our county. But I did want to just, uh, I always like, or I feel it's important that when we talk about the vibrant agricultural industry in Monterey County, is to not only uh, commend our, our farmers and agricultural leaders, but also to always take a, a moment to salute the, the workforce, the, those workers who put their lives on the line, even during this pandemic, to harvest those crops and put them on the tables of millions of Americans across our nation. Um, this seems to be uh, a, an area of a lot of publicity and attention, and even a, a documentary that's coming tonight on, tonight on Frontline. Um, but I, I did want to just commend our workers and the farmers who have done efforts here in Monterey County that have not been done any, anywhere else. We were the first county 
to champion for PPE for our farm workers. We were the first to um, have a ag, ag worker protection advisory um, any out of any county in the whole country. But we were also the first to put um, um, healthcare education um, by having our hospitals and our nurses go out into the work sites and educate farmers, uh, farm workers, and other employees, and um, and not not to mention um, the testing efforts now being done at at, at our ho local clinica del salud to provide more access for farm workers. So when we talk about the overall value of crops and the success it's having, I also uh, just in this conversation for the public want to also show the many other uh, efforts in leadership to also safeguard our workforce, those people who pick the crops and that our county should also highlight, not necessarily today, but we should just always highlight the other efforts that we've done to lead the nation and, and showing how local uh, policymakers working with healthcare advocates and our agricultural associations have teamed up to also look after the interest of farm workers and try to address those as best we can. Um, and that's all I wanted to say, but I, I, I thank you for the for this study. Um, but I also just wanted to remind our community that we've also done some other good efforts to making sure that we're taking care of everybody in agriculture. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Alejo. If I could just, I think that flows naturally from the report and the point you're making about taking care of those workers underscores the fact that when you do so, when you protect these farm workers, you're protecting the people who are driving about one fifth of Monterey County's economy. Yes, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. And it's like you were reading from my notes, but I'll save mine for after public comment. So at this point, I'd like to open it to public comment uh, on this on this uh, report. I see somebody coming forward in chambers, Mr. Light. No hands up. Thank you, Chair Bill Light, a resident of Monterey County. Um, and my grandfather used to say, "Keep the money local." So I'm glad the report kind of reflects it. That's still a mantra with a lot of folks here. A lot of people have always felt keeping the, keeping the money close and local was always uh, best for best for relationships and, and good for the community. Um, you know, co contributions, and I think about it from a landowner perspective, especially in agriculture, you know, they contribute an awful lot in property taxes. I mean, we're talking hundreds of millions or maybe billions of dollars worth of farm ground that the county collects their tax on. And um, of course, there's a whole array of other taxes and things that are paid by, by operators and landowners. <clears throat> and one, you brought up cannabis, and cannabis was mentioned by somebody else. You know, there was an opportunity to ladder up the tax on cannabis. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of square footage out there. I believe you had it at $15. That's what initially a couple years ago was gonna be the tax per square foot. You all lowered it to five. They made $450 million on 86 acres last year. You gave up basically almost $40 million in revenue. And I heard a lot of sob stories a couple months ago about how, oh, it's so tough to make money in this industry. They made $450 million. And I know it's gross receipts. I appreciate the Ag Commissioner pointing out it's gross receipts. But on that small of a footprint, I mean, my gosh. If you can't afford the $15, which was what all the experts, including the consultants and the, the attorneys, put together for this county as far as how they were going to charge for doing business, and the people of Monterey County giving these, op these cannabis operators an opportunity to build a new business, obviously one that's pretty gigantic, that you all gave them a tax break. And then when the time came for you to ladder it up to $15, you gave them another pass and kept it at $5. Where is all this extra money going? I'm sorry, $450 million on 86 acres. This is, this is really gross Thank negligence you, on Light. your part, in my opinion. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. I don't see any hands up via the Zoom, so I'm going to bring it back to the board. I just wanted to share my comments that what I appreciate so much about the report is the diversification, right? When we look at the fact that we have so many microclimates in Monterey County, our farmers and ranchers don't just look at one opportunity to say, all right, we're going to plant grapes and go all the way across the board and see what that does. They look at the microclimates, they look for opportunity, and they plant something different. That diversification of their crops, it gives them a buffer. I know so many people in the industry that don't just grow one crop, most grow at least six, seven, if not many more. And that diversification is 
possible here because of the microclimate. And what that also leads to is not a lot of mechanization because almost everything has to be hand-touched to be harvested. I know some grapes now are mostly machine, but nearly everything else has to be touched by people. And so I believe that the real economic engine that we're talking about here is the people, the people that harvest these crops, get them to store shelves, all the way from the person in the field actually picking, cutting, cleaning, bagging, to the folks who are transporting via truck, to the grocers who are putting that product on the shelf for our communities. And obviously there's the value-added lines where you see the bag of lettuce and everything else getting put together. But the people, that, that's our greatest asset. And that's why we do things like put together Esperanza Care, invest in housing as we've done today. And all those things come full circle to take care of the residents who power this largest economy, you know, within Monterey County. Yes, at 20 percent. And I would say perhaps during the height of the season, even more than that. You know, this is what we do here. We feed the world. And there are some extreme challenges uh, to that. And one of those key ones is housing. And so I, I want to I want to look at some of those talk about some of those other invisible benefits that happen in those areas around the economy. My father was a farm worker who moved with the crops all over the country uh, when he immigrated here from Mexico at the age of 12. And he ended up landing in Watsonville with the strawberries. And that was what my family did for the rest of their life and it being my grandfather on that side. But my dad saw an opportunity after he graduated from college to say, well, you know what, all these farmers need trucks. And so he got into the car business selling new trucks and that gave me the opportunities that I got in life to go to college, get an education, and be here at this dais today as the chair of this board advocating for that community, for those people who, ha who touch those crops, who, put them, who bring them to market, and who every single day are going to work to put food on the table of our nation. And so I want to make sure that we show them gratitude in, during this presentation because we're talking about big numbers. And those big numbers at the end of the day, to me, are positive for our community, but they're only a positive because of the work that we're able to do through them and the fact that our region is playing its part on the national scale during this COVID crisis, but also when the crisis isn't happening. All too often we forget about those folks that live in the shadows that are fearful of what is happening on a larger scale, right, when folks don't want to count them in the census. And we're here today seeing a lot of news that's meant to suppress census outturn, and I want to make sure that they know that they have a voice that voice is to the people on this board who advocated on their behalf and who fought for them. Uh, and so with those comments, I'll look to my colleagues and see if there's any additional comments before we accept the report. Supervisor Adams. I just have a, a few final comments I'd like to make. Uh, Henry, speaking of- Henry, uh, We're with Supervisor Adams. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll be right back. I didn't hear her. Yeah, thank you. Thanks very much, Supervisor Lopez. I just really want to underscore exactly what you've been saying. I mean, these essential workers have been going out day by day by day into the fields during this horrible time with COVID, and they deserve so much of our respect. The farm worker community has just sacrificed to keep our food supply and our food chain going, and we need to find ways to be able to give back to them and to their communities, given how much the industry contributes to our economy. And I think the, the uh, presentation that we had from Anastasia just beforehand about the housing uh, component, I think is the least that we can do to be able to thank them for the sacrifices that they make every day. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Adams. We're gonna wrap up with some comments from Commissioner Gonzalez. Yes, sorry about that. Uh, but I did wanna mention because uh, it was brought up about the, the people. It is no accident that when you go through this report and you look at the pictures, most of the pictures have people in the, in the, in the scene. Uh, and that is n no accident because uh, I, I agree with uh, the other uh, speakers that said that people is our number one uh, uh, commodity here. Our benefit uh, is uh, the people. I also want to mention that uh, there's a question about the cannabis. And, and if you look at the very uh, page 20, second to the last page on here, there's some additional questions, and one of them uh, does talk about uh, cannabis and, and hemp. Uh, so stay tuned for the future. And uh, also mentioned earlier that this was the third, which is in, I'm going to call it a series now, and they're five years apart. So this, this report was based on 2018 data, 
and the previous report was based on 2013 data and, and so on. So uh, we'll base the next one, uh, uh, I'm hoping, uh, in five years, hopefully uh, Dr. Langholz and uh, Dr. DePaulis uh, will be here to, uh, uh, to give us a discount on those uh, reports, uh, I'm, I'm hopeful. But with that, I want to thank uh, 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 Dr. Langhorst and uh, Dr. DePaulis again, and, and also Jose uh, Chang from our staff, who was very instrumental at helping get the, the little details uh, done with this report. Uh, with that, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner Gonzalez. We appreciate that. Okay, so that wraps the report. At this point, I'll see if we have anything to read out from closed session from County Council. There is nothing to report, Chair. Thank you. And so today we are adjourning in memory of Ralph Rubio, uh, mayor of, former mayor of Seaside, a good friend, and really one of those champions for Monterey County. And I want to turn to my colleagues first and see if they have any comments they'd like to make. Mr. Chair, if I, if I might. Supervisor Parker, yeah. Um, yes, I'd like to um, maybe just start by um, giving uh, a, just a brief overview of some of what we know about his life and then um, I think any other comments would be uh, most welcome and I I'm really appreciative of the fact that we are adjourning in memory today of, of Ralph Rubio he has been such a visible presence in our community um, in our area for uh, for many years um, he was um, uh, 69 years old uh, when he died the other day, born and raised in Seaside. Um, he attended local schools and uh, graduated from Seaside High and attended UC Berkeley. He was elected to the Seaside City Council in the year 2000 um, and uh, was the longest serving official, uh, elected official in Seaside um, in their history and served on the city council for 16 years total. Um, he was he served as mayor from 2004 to 2010, and then again from 2012 until 2018 when he decided uh, not to run for re-election. Um, as we know, when you serve on a city council or the board of supervisors, um, we serve on other boards and commissions, and that was certainly true for Mayor Rubio. Um, and he also volunteered for a number as well. So he was uh, past chair of the Seaside Groundwater Basin, um, the Seaside Water Master, anyway, the Transportation Agency for Monterey County and the Fort Ord Reuse Authority. Um, also, he was uh, president for two terms of the Association of Monterey Bay Area Governments, um, AMBAG. Um, he was chair of the FORA board um, and uh, was very active on that board in um, working on the development of the um, former Fort Ord, the Army base. He was uh, a member of the Carpenters Union for 39, 39 years, um, and 16 of those years he served as senior field representative for Monterey and, and Santa Cruz counties. Um, uh, Mayor Rubio. Uh, had been living with liver cancer since uh, the middle of 2014, but he went on serving the city of Seaside and in his regional capacity, um, he was the mayor for two more terms, uh, determined to stay the course and keep his vision of Seaside first. He leaves behind his wife, Gracie, uh, daughter, Michelle Rubio Moore, son-in-law, Eric Moore, and their son, Mario Rubio. Oh, wait. Oh, his son, Mario Rubio, as well as grandchildren and a great uh, grandchild. Uh, for now, no public memorial is planned uh, because of the COVID-19 situation, but the family uh, is planning to uh, hold one in the future when that is allowed. So thank you for letting me speak. Thank you, Supervisor Parker. Supervisor Phillips. Yeah, I knew Ralph well and worked with him well. He he reminded me a lot of of uh, Mayor Gunter. Uh, they're both hardworking people in their individual fields, and then devoted that same hard work into to to their community. And he loved Seaside and worked so hard, especially for the economic development of Seaside. He was even when you knew he 
he, he was struggling health wise. Uh, you'd, you'd hear that he was in the hospital the day before and, and he, you, you wouldn't expect to see him at a meeting and any walk uh, sometimes looked like he just got out of the hospital. Um, just uh, a great guy. Um, his, his leadership was really missed uh, when we lost him on Fora, when we lost him on MMW. Uh, he was a, a big presence. Uh, a good man and uh, lit a, lived a good life. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Phillips. Supervisor Adams. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks very much um, for the opportunity for us to honor him and to um, let his wife, Gracie, particularly know that we're thinking of her and all of the, uh, the wonderful years and the times that they shared together. He was a, such a big presence in Seaside specifically. You know, you couldn't go anywhere where you just didn't end up bumping into him. And as Supervisor Phillips said, you know, you'd see him at a meeting and he would just look like he was really struggling. And then, boom, two weeks later, he's out, you know, he's in an event and he's just really, um, I think he lived life so well. And um, as hard as it is to uh, have cancer and to live with it, to be able to keep the very strong spirit that you have and the, the sort of life force that you do, Ralph just really had that. I know he was great comfort to uh, Burl Smith when she lost her husband, Jerry. Um, and uh, there have been many people who have benefited from a side of Ralph that probably a lot of people didn't know. And that was just this unbelievably kind and supportive heart. I didn't always agree with him, but I always respected him as he did me. And I liked him just very, very much. He'll be missed so much. He has, uh, has left very big shoes to fill. In fact, I don't think there will be anyone who can fill his shoes, but um, fortunately we'll be able to take some truly fond memories with us as he moves forward. And I hope that that brings comfort to, uh, to Gracie. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Adams. Supervisor Alejo. Thank you, and I want to uh, appreciate my colleagues for, for their words for Mayor uh, Ralph Rubio. Um, I, I want to just express my condolences to his wife and to his family, um, and to let them know that his um, that uh, Mayor Rubio was respected by many of us in Monterey County. Um, it was just unfortunate that there weren't more Latino elected officials on the Monterey Peninsula. He was the longest serving and one of the few even though places like um, Seaside are 43% Latino, the demographics are rapidly changing. But I hope that, that his trailblazing work and his example will hopefully inspire other young Latinos and Latinas to run for office on the Monterey Peninsula and in other parts of our county. I, I just remember being young and watching um, voting rights uh, champions like Maldif um, President Joaquin Avila, who first came to this area to fight for more representation because Latinos, there were almost no Latino elected officials in Santa Cruz or Monterey County. And some of those early battles really opened the doors of opportunity. And people like Ralph and Simone and um, Oscar Rios and Watsonville were some of the early pioneers who set the example. And uh, being a young teenager and watching them serve in office, I think uh, is a reason why many of us are able to stand on their shoulders and be in office today. So I just wanna just, show my respect and, and, and acknowledge that work, the work they did. And anybody who saw Ralph at any meeting would tell you he, he ran a meeting very well, uh, one of the very astute and, uh, and, and an expert at parliamentary procedure. Um, but I think, uh, I think he will be missed, just seeing him around at meetings. I miss him when he just left serving on, on many boards and, and, and leaving political office. But um, it's sad that to not see him enjoy his retirement for a longer period of time with his wife. Um, but um, my prayer is off to all his family and friends. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Alejo. Next, I'm going to ask Nick Chulos to come to the microphone and share some words with us as well. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to say a few words about Ralph uh, from a personal perspective. I uh, worked, you know, as a staff member, and Ralph was an elected official, and we knew each other somewhat, you know, in meetings, but not well, particularly. But uh, when I lost my first wife in 2008, um, Ralph apparently had lost his first wife, and he went out of his way to be supportive of me and, and really to approach me and along the lines of someone who had been where I was, and he basically said, you can get through this. You can do this, you know. And um, 
I'll always remember that about Ralph, and I really appreciate that, and I thought I'd like to say that. Thank you, Nick. We appreciate it. On my behalf, I do want to send my thoughts, prayers, and condolences to Gracie and the family. Um, I was a staffer here in my past life working for Supervisor Salinas, and often when you're staff, people kind of brush by you and go to the elected official. You know, that's, that's the person you want to talk to. But Ralph always made sure to acknowledge my presence, and I know I share the story on social media, but he took time at a meeting one day to ask me about who I was as a person. And I shared with him that I was passionate about gardening and trees. And he said, you know, I've got a, I've got a tree at, a, at a, an old family home on the east side of Salinas that I really, I, I hate to lose the property, to have to sell it or rent it out because I worry about this tree. Uh, it's a fig tree. Any ideas of what I could do? Could I transplant it? And I told him, no, I don't think you can do that, but we can take cuttings and help you grow a ton of trees off that one tree, and then you can hand them out to your family and make sure that everybody in the family has one. He thought that was the greatest idea, and uh, he walked away that day, and I thought maybe I'll never hear from him again, and about a week later he was in my office, and he had his calendar out, and he said, okay, when can we go do this? And so I met him on the east side about a week after that, and we, we made about 12 trees. We took the cuttings, and I explained to him how he needed to keep them misted and in shade until they really took root, and... Um, you know, I, he, every time I saw him after that, he'd give me an update. You know, first leaf, hey, they have a second leaf. Most of them have doubled in size. He was so excited about these trees that he was going to gift to all the members of his family. And one day I walked into my office, and on my desk there was a tree. And I was still a staffer and yet to walk in and have this tree from the mayor of a, of a town out on the peninsula who I got to help with the project felt really good to me. And I'm really going to miss Ralph and his smile and his presence at so many events that we were able to show up at together. But uh, I planted that tree in my garden, and it's now standing at about four feet tall. And uh, he'll be greatly missed. So with that, we're adjourned in memory of Ralph Rubio. Thank you.